Have you ever looked into a headlight or other bright object and seen something that looks like this? What even is this pattern anyway? The answer is actually not that obvious. Many people don't really think about it too much. It's just a fact of life that bright objects tend to produce glare and obscure objects around them. The thing is, this doesn't really make a lot of sense given the typical assumptions made about light. Where is this halo being emitted from? How is it bending from its original source to arrive at the sensor as though it came from somewhere else? When we think of light, we imagine that it follows a straight path, like a ray. We even build entire renderers based on this assumption, called ray tracers. Unfortunately, this assumption is not completely correct. In fact, most renderers do not natively support glare or bloom, and it usually has to be faked in through post-processing. In this video, I'm going to discuss what causes this effect and how to simulate it in a physically realistic way with software. Let's start with what does not cause bloom. When I was younger, I wanted to understand this effect and came up with my own uh, genius theory, really. My theory was that only a few receptors in the camera sensor, or our eye, are hit with the bright object's light, but it's just so powerful that they overflow and activate the receptors around them, creating a sort of glow effect in the final image. Unfortunately for me, my theory was not entirely correct. But, to my credit, there is some truth to it. Some types of image sensors do actually have this property. If you owned one of those really bad handheld camcorders from the early 2000s, you may remember seeing vertical streaks in the image when you pointed the camera at a bright light. Well, as it turns out, these cameras use sensors called CCDs, or charge coupled devices, and they do sort of leak, but they do so preferentially in the vertical axis. And we know that bloom happens in all directions with all types of image sensors, so this cannot possibly be the entire explanation. So what is the real explanation then? In reality, this is caused by the nature of light itself. You may remember from physics class that light is actually a wave, or technically it can act like both a particle and a wave, but for our purposes, let's just say it's a wave. To understand the implications of this, imagine two pools of water, separated from each other by a wall with a small opening in it. Now, if you create a plane wave in one pool, what do you think will happen when that wave interacts with this opening? It would be very strange if this plane wave just kept on going, unimpeded by this obstacle. What actually happens is the water wave diffracts into circular waves at the opening. These circular waves interfere with each other, and this interference pattern propagates through the second pool until the waves strike the back wall. Notice how the amplitude of the wave is not uniform across this wall, but is actually segmented into bands. This is actually very similar to what happens with light. Instead of water waves, we have light waves. Instead of this one-dimensional opening, we have a two-dimensional camera opening called an aperture. By the way, your eye also has an aperture, which is called the pupil. Camera apertures are typically formed by blades, which can be opened or closed to allow more or less light into the camera. The analogous feature in your eye is your iris, which can change the size of your pupil depending on light conditions. After light passes through the aperture, it's usually focused by a series of lenses before it hits a sensor of some kind. In a DSLR, this would be a small CMOS sensor in the body of the camera, and in our case, it would be the light receptive cells that form our retinas near the back of the eye. The pattern that we see is actually the diffraction pattern that is formed by the camera aperture. This pattern is entirely dependent on the geometry of that aperture. In fact, the pattern is actually the 2D Fourier transform of that aperture. If you think you're not familiar with Fourier transforms, don't worry, you definitely are. Have you ever seen a frequency visualizer like this? Well, if you have, you have seen a Fourier transform. In this case, the visualizer is taking sound and then breaking it down into its frequency components. However, we're not limited to analyzing sound this way. Sound is nothing but a stream of data in the time domain, 
and an image is a stream of data in the spatial domain, and we happen to have two dimensions. For both data types, the techniques used are the same, and the vast majority of software implementations use the Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT for short. Today, we're going to be using the scripting language and user interface I wrote. It's mainly intended for path tracing, and I talk about it in a bit more detail in some of my other videos. In addition to path tracing, though, it has tools for signal processing, like the Fast Fourier Transform. Let's take a look at some examples. Here's an image of a vertical wave with a single frequency. Let's see what the Fourier transform of this image looks like. It might not seem like much, but if you zoom in, you can actually see two little dots. This is the entire Fourier transform. What this is trying to tell us is actually very intuitive. Think of the y-axis as vertical frequency and the x-axis as horizontal frequency. We have to also remember that the 2D Fourier transform is symmetrical, so technically we only care about one of these dots. This dot is located at x equals 0, which implies that it has no horizontal frequency, and a little up on the y-axis, which implies that it has a vertical frequency component, which of course it does because it's literally a vertical wave. To confirm this, let's increase the frequency of the wave. Exactly as you would expect, the dot has moved up, indicating that the vertical frequency component in the image has increased. Now, let's try adding another dimension. If I add a horizontal wave, then what we would expect to see is a new dot on our Fourier transform along the x-axis, which is exactly what we do end up seeing. Let's try something more interesting, like this vertical line or if you're more familiar with physics terminology, a slit. Taking the Fourier transform of this function gives this very thin pattern of bands. Some of you may recognize this as a single slit experiment. We can also replicate another famous experiment, the double slit experiment. Just as a reference, here are some results from a real double slit experiment. If we run the simulation, we get this. As you can see, this perfectly replicates the smaller bands that break up the bigger bands. The only problem is that the pattern is a bit too thin vertically. But this actually makes sense. Our input has no vertical variation. It's the same everywhere along the y-axis, so we wouldn't expect to see anything in the vertical frequency space. If we make the vertical slits shorter, as they would be of a finite size in real life, we get this more realistic pattern, which matches observations a lot better. We can do something similar for any aperture geometry. Let's try a polygonal aperture with seven blades, which is pretty common in entry-level DSLR lenses. This gives this very familiar starfish shape that we often see in photography. Somewhat counterintuitively, we see 14 arms in this starfish shape instead of seven. Remember how I said earlier that the Fourier transform is symmetrical? Well, each blade will result in an arm on either side of the pattern. In the case of even blade designs, the arms will just happen to overlap, so you see six apparent arms and not twelve. This is a real picture I took with my own DSLR, which has a seven blade aperture, and as you can see, there are fourteen arms, just as we predicted. All right, so we have a simulation that is capable of producing a diffraction pattern, but we're still missing something. In real life, it's very rare that we ever see a single wavelength of light, and unfortunately, that's exactly what we've simulated, so it isn't of much use to us. Luckily, the relationship between wavelength and this diffraction pattern is trivial. The longer the wavelength, the larger the pattern. All we have to do then is step through all light wavelengths in the visible spectrum, scale the diffraction pattern accordingly, and then layer all of these on top of each other. This will produce the full diffraction pattern and a very satisfying simulation to watch. To use this pattern, all we have to do is perform a convolution with the light entering the camera. In other words, we take each pixel of our source image and then transform it to this pattern. Here's a test image, and here it is after it has been convolved with a diffraction pattern. 
We don't really see too much of a bloom effect yet, but it does look a bit blurrier. This is actually physically accurate. Lenses are not capable of resolving details beyond a certain limit, largely due to this diffraction effect. Optical microscopes are actually limited for a very similar reason. If we start increasing the brightness of the image, you can see that the bloom effect becomes more and more apparent. Note that nothing is changing about the diffraction pattern. It stays the same, but appears to be growing because most of its energy is near the center, and the small amount in the arms is not noticeable until the brightness is increased significantly. So in a sense, it's always there, we just don't really see it because the light isn't bright enough. Just for fun, let's see if we can approximate a human eye. This is the aperture function I'm using as my pupil approximation. Alright, let's run this simulation and see what happens. I don't know about you, but this looks pretty similar to what I see when I look at a bright point source. You can clearly see the multicolored artifacts, and the pattern is captured in quite a lot of detail. When we do the convolution, we can see that those color artifacts are also present in the final image. Have you ever noticed that your phone camera takes really blurry pictures when it's dirty? Well, we can simulate that effect too. All we need is a dirt map, which I created quickly in Photoshop. By the way, I really don't want whoever owns this phone to touch my phone ever. The dirty phone simulation looks especially convincing when it's convolved with a real image. Just as a reference, here is a picture taken with my own phone after I've smudged the lens as much as I could. And they look pretty similar to me. If anyone is interested in learning more about this phenomenon, it's called Fraunhofer diffraction. It doesn't account for all diffraction effects, but it's the one that we usually notice and probably the most useful for rendering. All of the code for this project is open source, including the scripting language. This is actually the script that I use to generate all of the demos in this video. Thank you all very much for watching. I really enjoy writing simulations, and if you enjoy content like this, please let me know in the comments. Alright, I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye for now.